Ladies and gentlemen, goobers and ghouls, dear listeners, welcome back to Fear Boners. Fear Boners, presented by the Down in Front Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and I feel like it's only yesterday that we just talked. And maybe that's because I'm actually trying to bang out a couple episodes within a few moments of each other, because I just finished recording my last episode. And since this is an audio medium, time is illusory, and we never quite know how long it is between episodes, but it's so nice to see you again, even though I just got finished talking to you. The fact of the matter is I'm back, it's October, and there's so many good movies to be talking about right now, so I'm probably going to bang out a few more episodes before the end of the month. You guys are going to be slammed with so much content, you're going to be sick of hearing from me by the end of the month. Depending on our release schedule, we still have to figure that out, obviously. But, what we're here to talk about today is a little film that was recently released on Netflix called The Apostle. But before we get into that, obviously we're going to get to the important stuff first. What am I drinking? Uh, Right now I am still drinking that John Stetson bourbon. Cheap as all hell. It is a deal and a half, considering that it is pretty primo bourbon that um, is apparently not being made anymore, so they're selling it for a very affordable rate down the street from my house, and, um, yeah, I'm slugging it, it is, uh, helping me get through this, and, yeah, it's, uh, definitely good stuff, if you can find it anywhere near you, I definitely recommend it, especially when you get the deal that I got, but, as for what I'm watching, I did recently watch the first installment of Hulu's Into the Dark series, a series of horror movies that they have guaranteed will be released every month going forward for the rest of the year, starting this month, with The Body. The Body is an interesting movie in that it is basically a Halloween movie. It takes place on Halloween. It's a good movie to watch around Halloween. I would recommend seeing it. I don't necessarily feel like I had enough to say about it to warrant an entire episode, depending on if other people do want to talk about it with me. It was a fun little movie, basically a hitman, an assassin, classy British gentleman, kills someone for money, and we're introduced to him early on in the movie, and then basically he's lugging the body around for the rest of the film, almost in a weird Weekend at Bernie's type situation. But it's a lot more grim, a lot darker. Nobody realizes he's actually hauling around a body because they think it's part of his costume. That joke gets really old early in the film. There's some fun stuff, some fun character interactions and things like that, but for the most part, a lot of the characters are very annoying. Even the hitman, to a degree, you kind of want him to win at the end, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I could care less. I didn't care enough about anybody in the movie. They all kind of sucked. But Ray Santiago, I believe, is the actor's name. He shows up. He's a gentleman from Ash vs. Evil Dead, if you love that show as much as I do. I was really excited to see him, and he plays kind of a fun role, albeit still kind of annoying. Nobody's really, like, besides the, the killer, is really, like, a main character. Everybody's just kind of forgettable for the most part. But, you know, it's definitely worth a watch. Definitely around Halloween. It's a good, fun Halloween movie for adults, obviously. But not in a weird porno way, but in a horror movie way. I realized the way that I said that was kind of strange. But yes, it is a fun movie. Not a great movie, but I'm definitely, definitely excited to see where Hulu goes with more of these installments of the Into the Dark series and what kind of horror comes from it. You know, some of the other platforms like... Netflix have been dropping horror series. This is a series of sort, but it is a full-length feature movie, which is cool. So it's going to be a series of, I guess, 12 movies, which is kind of cool. It sort of reminds me of that Masters of Horror series that they did a few years back, that they got a lot of the iconic horror directors to make feature films. And that was presented on Cinemax or Showtime? I can't remember, but it was eventually released. They were all released on DVDs, and most of those were fantastic. So if you haven't seen that, check that out. I'm hoping that 
Into the Dark turns into something similar like that, sort of like an anthology of horror movies, which would be amazing. Not to say that this first introductory step was a misstep. It's still enjoyable, not terrible by any means, but I just don't think warrants a full episode. So, Hulu's The Body. Check it out if you have Hulu, especially if you're looking for good, creepy content to watch in the spooky month of Spooktober. But yeah, that's what I'm drinking, that's what I'm watching. As for what we're going to be talking about this evening, The Apostle on Netflix, another Netflix original, starring Dan Stevens from Legion. If you haven't seen Legion, you should probably watch Legion. Not that it has anything to do with the show, but Dan Stevens, before this, has not been in a lot of stuff. He's been in some, like, rom-com movies and nothing that I really recognize, but, like, his performance in Legion is incredible. He plays a great crazy person, and everybody in that everybody in that show deserves awards because that show is just so off the walls bonkers and weird and bizarre and trippy and they just do such a great performance and he really brings that into this role because it's such a it's a lot more serious because in legion he sort of gets to to flex his crazy bone he does have a lot of really serious moments but in this movie it's pretty much a hundred percent dire because basically not only do we have Dan Stevens, but we have Gareth Evans, the gentleman who directed the Raid series. So if you love nonstop, brutal, karate, kung fu action film, basically cop drama, hyper-violent cop drama kung fu movie. I don't think that's actually the martial art that they're using in that film, so I apologize if I'm not 100% accurate there. But those movies, The Raid 1 and 2... If you haven't seen them, stop this podcast right now and watch The Raid 1 and 2 because they are some of the best movies to come out in the last few years, hands down. It's almost a travesty that they're getting ready to remake them just because they can remake them in the U.S. and English. I think that's dumb. I think they're only going to ruin the movies. But anyway, he directed this movie, so after seeing him make these crazy fighting films... Having him make a horror movie is like a dream for me. And I only found out about this movie like maybe a month ago. They did a good job of keeping it pretty hush-hush, at least from me. Um, I hadn't heard anything about it until recently, and then it just kind of came out. So that's kind of nice. I didn't have to wait for it, felt like. But, so we have Dan Stevens in the starring role. There's going to be a lot of other people that are going to be like, oh yeah, that guy. I did recognize a lot of these people, but I haven't really done research into what else they've been in that I've noticed them from. But there's a lot of oh, that guy, kind of British actors that you're going to be like, oh, yeah, like, I recognize him. Probably Game of Thrones. A lot of those guys tend to be in Game of Thrones. But, essentially, we're set up for early 1900s in London, England, where, essentially, a, a kidnapping has occurred, where the daughter of a wealthy man has been taken, and there's been a ransom note left. But the father who this ransom was supposed to be delivered to, or not delivered to, but the ransom was asked from because he's the wealthy father of this woman who was kidnapped, is basically old and senile and non-functioning. Like, his heart was broken after his wife died, and there's a a lot of backstory crammed into, like, two minutes right up front. Like, basically, he just sits in a chair all day and can't function and can't even read the note. And you're basically introduced to Dan Stevens' character, who looks very rough, like, he just came back from God knows where. At first, my initial reaction was that he was, like, a like a street tough. Like, maybe he was disowned by the family and lived a shitty life. But, yeah. So, what we're going to get into right now is basically the movie itself. So, if you haven't seen The Apostle and really do want to see it, this is, again, just going to be my spoiler warning. We are going to get into some spoilers for the film. And um, we're going to be discussing the film at length. So, if you do want to see it without any spoilers, go ahead and stop the podcast. Watch it right now. And then come back and listen to the rest of the podcast, because we're going to be talking about the plot in depth. But okay, so Dan Stevens' character is disheveled. He has a long beard, he has long hair, and he looks just strung out. But later in the film, we find out that this is because he was basically on a Christian mission mission over in China, I believe, and his entire group got slaughtered. And they had believed him dead, but somehow he managed to survive and make it all the way back home only to find that his dad had gone crazy and gotten old and and just couldn't function and his his sister was kidnapped so it's like you weren't there to to protect your family and your family basically fell apart so that's a fucked up state of mind to be in going into what he has to deal with now so basically 
I'm assuming whoever he was speaking to in the beginning of the movie was like his his father's lawyer or the 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 head of the estate basically telling him well now you're in charge we're not going to give you the ransom because we're not going to pay ransom this is ridiculous but we want you to go find your sister and rescue her so he's got he's very single-minded in this mission to rescue his sister and basically the setup is this there's a group of people who live on an island and they're essentially a cult but they're basically under the guise of a religious order of people who moved outside of the empire of England to basically live on their own, free of oppression and free of taxes, essentially, is a big thing for them. They don't want to be taxed, and they don't want to live under the oppressive religious restrictions of the UK, I guess you could say, um, or of just England in general at the time. And so they're on this island that they claim to be their own, and in order to make this work, they have kidnapped the daughter of this rich family trying to extort money out of them to fund this crazy idea they have to live self-sustained on this island, claiming that they don't need money, they don't need things, but really are doing these terrible things behind the backs of the people that they're trying to take care of. So they present themselves as nice people when really they're criminals. (laughs) Seems like nothing's changed, am I right? But anyway, when he is on his way, he's basically given the story from the executor of the estate and said like, hey, we're going to send you on this mission. You have to save your sister. We're not sending you with any money. You just have to go in, pretend to be one of them and like spirit your sister back without them knowing. You already know off the bat, (laughs) this movie, this movie has a running length of a little over two hours. So you know, that's not going to happen. It's going to get complicated. So he basically winds up in the island right on the bat. When he's getting on the boat, there's like a boat that picks up the people who are basically joining this cult. And as they're lined up to get on the boat, the one dude who's captaining the boat starts pulling books and stuff out of people's hands and says, there's no printed material allowed on the island except for the word of Prophet Malcolm, I think his name is. Then they start talking about, like, the lady. We're not quite sure who she is yet or, like, what that has to do, but they speak with it in these very heavy, veiled religious uh, overtones, so you kind of think that that's maybe the the goddess that they might worship or or what have you, or the cult. And Dan Stevens' character notices on his ticket, it's been marked with like a a red seal or a red dot that none of the, like he kind of glances at other people's tickets and none of them have that red dot. So he realizes that something's up. Sees this guy who is unpacking his suitcase that was mostly filled with books. So. If all you were going to do is travel over there with books, and then suddenly you have a suitcase that's very light because you weren't able to bring any books over, I guess you lucked out in that way, but you probably should have packed better. So Dan Stevens says he's going to help him, goes down, bends over, sees that his ticket is sitting there, swaps their tickets, grabs some of the books, helps him dump them in the fire, but then leaves the guy with the marked ticket. So he gets on the boat, sneaks on, essentially... Because he knows that at that point they're already aware that somebody... Like, obviously they sent the ransom so they know that somebody's coming. So he notices, he kind of watches the other guy get on with the marked ticket. And at that point the guys kind of like look at him funny and then mark his suitcase. Obviously so that when they get over to the other side of the... To the island, when they get off, they see the guy with his marked suitcase. And all of a sudden all the guys sort of swarm him as everybody's getting off the boat. And then at that point, we already know that something's up, and this isn't... Obviously, we already know it's not on the up-and-up, because they kidnapped this poor girl, but you just don't know how bad it's going to get until you get deeper and deeper into this movie. And there's so many different things that happen in this movie. I feel like it definitely requires a second viewing, because there's so many characters, and it does get very deep. Like, the character... A lot of the characters motivations and qualities are more implied and you sort of are left to assume what has happened previously between some of these people because there's not there's a bit of building but most of it is going to have to be assumed on the part of the viewer and so we're on this isolated island with this very ramshackle like well built but still ramshackle town where people are basically when they get off the boat they are tested by a doctor and by tested I mean like he checks them for lice and like looks down their throat make sure they don't have any signs of like you know I don't know the plague or any sort of illness that might really fuck up the island because if you think if one person gets sick on an island everybody's gonna get sick so he checks them out and then you have to register with someone he asks your name and if you have a criminal record things like that and then you get checked in and you get like a I think like a bar of soap and a jar 
and later it's found that the jar is because you basically have to leave, uh, you have to donate blood at the end of every night. You have to basically fill it partially with blood for some reason, which doesn't really, now that I'm saying that, it doesn't really come back around, but you do find out what the blood is for. Like, you don't see them collect, I don't think you see them collecting the jars or doing anything like that, but you do realize why they're collecting the blood. So, at this point, Dan Stevens' character is basically on a stealth mission where he's essentially trying to blend in. But as soon as this happens and he's he's working his way into the town itself and the, the group of people settled there, you realize it is a very small knit community. And as soon as he's settled in, he's basically told it's time to go to church. He has to go to church and you're introduced to Prophet Malcolm. And he's basically the head of the group. And he tells a story about how this community was started after three of the men were lost at sea and they washed up on shore of this island and were rescued by the lady which you're still not 100% sure who or what she is. And then at this point is when Dan Stevens starts seeing the lady. Like, you're not really sure at this point, but he keeps seeing a woman sort of skirting out of the corner of his eye through windows in the distance. And you're not entirely sure what you're seeing yet at this point, but he's sitting there watching this enigmatic man at the front of the church give this crazy story of, like, how this group began, how this cult began this commune, as it were, and everybody seems very happy and very well taken care of, and, you know, that doesn't really, that's not really addressed at any point, is how, like, happy everybody is, but really, there are these different characters that we are introduced to, and that's, it's a strength and it's a weakness of the movie, is that Gareth Evans really develops a lot of these other characters in the same way that he does in the Raid series, and at a certain point, it does get hard to keep track of, because, it jumps away from Dan Stevens' character at certain points, and then we're introduced to a side story where Dan Stevens gets very close with the daughter of Prophet Malcolm, and then a daughter of one of the other three guys who established the community is also close with this other boy on the island, but he has a strange affinity for his daughter. It's almost applied that he's almost, like, creeping on his own daughter, which is really uncomfortable, and yeah, it, it's it's implied because there's scenes where he's, like, watching her use the bathroom and things like that. Because there's, like, a hole in the, the door of the outhouse. And there's a lot of, like, weird, uneasy stuff like that. Where you think, like, maybe this is why they ran away or brought their family in the first place. Because they had strange proclivities. Or, like, he did. And then at that point later in the film, it's established that the other guy's daughter is having a secret affair with this other young boy from the community who is the son of the third guy who was the survivor who helped establish the community so at that point okay let me break it down the daughter of the main prophet guy has a thing for dan stevens character they meet really early on they keep bumping into each other and they're kind of intrigued with each other the daughter of one of the other survivors who helped establish the community is having a secret nighttime tryst with the son of the third survivor if that all makes sense. But the dad is not happy about it. He has his, he has his suspicions. But then it's found out that she gets pregnant later in the movie. And of course, being a very tight-knit religious community that it is, he tries to cast these aspersions on the daughter that she's a harlot and that thing in her womb is evil. And that develops into a whole terrifying scene later in the movie. But there's some of these great scenes where Dan Stevens is wandering around and seeing things. Like, he's the one who, he he's, like, wandering around after doing his daily chores or daily work. And he sees people putting their blood in the jars. Like, all the family, like, everybody in the family has to put their blood in one jar. So that's where that's established. But it's also established, and this is where my idea that maybe Dan Stevens was a drug addict before I realized he was a survivor of the crazy experience he had over in Asia. He keeps doing these drops, either before he sleeps or, like, if he can't focus or if he gets, like, shaky. He takes out these little, these little, I don't even know what it's supposed to be, but it's, like, in a dropper, and he, like, dropped four drops in his mouth, on his tongue, and he kind of, like, he makes, like, a weird face, and then he's, like, better. He's fine. It's probably one of those old-timey medicine treatments that actually was just drugs. Like, it's probably a painkiller of some sort that's also kind of an opiate. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it's supposed to be. So he is, in a degree, I guess, an addict, because you see him do that several times throughout the movie, and he's sort of battling with that. And so then, around that time, when he's leaving the church, we see he's kind of lagging behind everyone, 
and he sees the guys from the boat bring or maybe this is on his way to the church he sees the guys from the boat who are dressed almost as enforcers they got all these like duster jackets they're holding the body of the dude that he gave the marked ticket to and so they're dragging like what looks like a bloody lifeless body up to shore and into a cabin in the area so he he's under the impression that they killed that guy later on after the first church sermon they call Malcolm in into a side room and you realize like his character kind of falls he's like well what the hell did you do to this guy why is he, he's beat all, almost all the way to death like he's not going to tell us anything even if it's the guy and then they say he had the marked ticket and then he talks to him and he realizes that he's not the the one he's just like a clueless dude who got caught with the wrong ticket like he realizes that like the they're smart enough where they realize like oh no the ticket got swapped out the guy that we're actually looking for is here so then at that point they know they have to be at alert and they're looking for dan stevens character they don't know it's him but they know that the the girl's brother is here and he's trying to sneak around but it's pretty brutal you can tell the guy's the guy they beat up is pretty messed up because he can barely talk and he's like kind of having a hard time moving and he's kind of mumbling and you can tell there's probably either some brain damage or they just like really wailed on him too hard so the the prophet basically like gives the one guy a wink and he says like some peaceful things to him to kind of like you know you just came here for peace and i'm really sorry that didn't work out for you and then the dude just straight up slits his throat and just kills him and that's when you realize that this movie is going to be brutal because it gets way worse than that. Now I'm realizing as I'm thinking about the plot of this movie, I'm jumping around a little bit in the beginning, but I know there's going to be some things that aren't going to make sense until you see the movie itself. But from here, we know who's the bad guy, who's the good guy, and sort of get a good idea of what's going to happen. So Dan Stevens' character starts having weird dreams, seeing some strange shit, and we get a vibe that there is something else going on on the island. There's a particular scene where he comes back from sneaking around, where basically at night he's sneaking around, sees the daughter of the one guy and the son of the other guy basically coming back from having their affair, catches them, and then that's where his relationship with the boy gets established because you get in trouble for going out past curfew. So the, the boy knows that he was out there and he knows that the boy was out there, but they're not going to they're not going to like tell on each other. And so they start talking the next day and he basically grills him for information and tries to get as much information out of him. And he tries to figure out why he's wandering around on the Island. And then he says, well, you know, like, why don't I tell them that you're having an affair with what's his face, his daughter. And that shuts him right up. And then he says like, okay, whatever you need, I'll help you. And so he gets him all the insider information Meanwhile, they know that someone was wandering around at night, and so the the security, for lack of a better term, and the prophet and the other two guys basically pull in a group of, I don't know, six or seven dudes into the church and say, like, I know one of you guys was wandering around at night, like, I'm testing your faith, and you need to either let me know right away who it was, or I don't think they really give him an ultimatum, but basically he goes down the line and starts quoting verse from, like, the Book of the Lady or whatever it is, because they have their own version of the Bible. Everybody gets a copy of it when they get on the island, and it has, like, it's all written out. I don't think it's really established where this book came from, but it's a pretty thick book. It's like a Bible-sized book, so it would have taken them some time to write that. So it's basically establishing that this island and this cult has been around for a while. And so they have this group of guys, the prophet starts talking, and then he leaves the quote up to the next person, and the person will continue it. And if they can quote the book, then he knows they're legit. So then he goes on to the next guy, and he goes on to the next guy, and he's getting closer to Dan Stevens, and Dan Stevens is like, fuck, I don't know, like... I have no idea. Like, I've never even read this book. He keeps ripping, he keeps going back to his room and ripping pages out of the book to write notes or to, like, draw maps so he can remember how, the layout. So he's never actually read the book. So then there's this tense moment where they're in the church and he can tell they're, they're either about to bust him and he's about to, like, pull something out to, like, attack or, like, defend himself. But then he notices the dude next to him starts to pull out a dagger. And when the dude next to him gets grilled for the the next verse in the the lady bible whatever we want to call it he doesn't say anything and then he said he says something like god save the queen or something like he's basically like an agent of the of the throne he's basically been sent there by the queen of england to basically stop this and so he goes to try to attack the prophet the prophet is whisked away and then all the cop guys like almost out of nowhere and this is where it starts to come through where it's like oh yeah this is the guy that did the raid they all pull out halberds, like giant, crazy, sharp spears, and just skewer the shit out of this dude. Like, he is impaled, like, seven different ways. 
he looks like <laughs> if you've ever if you're as old as me you've ever played i don't even know if they make this game anymore but it was a game called kerplunk where you basically put cocktail straws through a weird colander thing and you had to like as you pulled them out the marbles would drop through and whoever dropped through all the marbles lost he looked like kerplunk he had like all these things just sticking through him and there's just blood everywhere and he's still alive and he's still kind of talking but then he dies and in that moment, Dan Stevens does have a knife or something, and he tries to... Or no, the guy had a knife, and he tried to defend the prophet. He basically is selling his character at this point, because he's trying to cast as much suspicion off of himself. So when the guy goes to get him, he grabs him, and the guy slashes him with the knife, doesn't get to the prophet, and then he gets impaled, and then Dan Stevens is there kind of with like a huge like gash wound on his chest. And so he saved the guy that he sort of wants to kill because he knows that this guy's the one that's in charge of kidnapping his his sister which is sort of a brilliant move and sort of like an idiot move i don't know if it would have made things go any different in the movie if the prophet had been killed at that point but at that point they get dan stevens to this is where he really meets the daughter because the daughter is basically the medical person on the like the doctor on the island and she's in charge she patches him up and they get to talking and the prophet basically does like a blood pact with Dan Stevens where he slashes his hand and says like, you know, like you bled for me, I'll bled for you, whatever you need, like I'll take care of you. And it's like, okay, like that's nice, but you're still kind of awful. And then from here, there's a few jumps in the movie where it just gets like real weird where I think this is one of the points where Dan Stevens has a weird dream about the lady of the island and he starts seeing her more often. And it's basically implied at this point that one, the one girl tries to talk to the prophet's daughter and say, hey, you know things, like, I think I'm pregnant, how do I know for sure? And then the rumors start milling around, and the the one girl's dad starts to find out, and that becomes sort of like a subplot as Dan Stevens starts to wander around more and try to locate his sister. But then they realize that he's definitely still there. And by he, I mean the the brother of the sister that they've kidnapped. They don't know it's Dan Stevens yet. And so they bring out the sister who previously the one guy's son who knocked up the other guy's daughter had told him that he thought she was dead. But that night they bring his, they bring out Dan Stevens' sister and basically put her in the square, threatened to kill her. And he's losing his mind. Cause he's like, oh, I can't like, he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like he's just watching out of his window, watching them like holding a knife to her neck. And they're basically screaming like, if you don't come out, we'll kill her. And they don't. But they do leave her there in the square, and one of the guys is, like, watching her with one of the giant spears. And he's there, like, thinking he's got to do his drugs to, like, calm down, but then he smashes his bottle. So at that point, you know that, like, Dan Stevens is going to be as clear as he ever has, but he's going to be in pain throughout the rest of the movie because whatever's going on, like, he doesn't have that to rely on anymore. And so the next day, Dan Stevens' sister is sitting in the square. She's all dirty and gross. And there's kids that are poking her with sticks, and there's there's kids like braiding her hair and like rubbing dirt in her hair and like treating her all shittily and there's not a moment while she's out there I don't think that Dan Stevens is outside and they see each other because they don't actually see each other until later in the film but the prophet's daughter gets upset and like shoos all the kids away and like tells the security guys to go away and like feeds her and like tries to help the sister but then they basically at that point take the sister away and that's sort of when the sister is taken away to a basement where Dan Steven has seen the prophet go into the basement before. So he knows there's this creepy basement in one of the houses where they go down to deal with something. At this point, we're not sure what it is. There's this creepy moment because there's so many of these little takeaway creepy moments where, like, for example, in the first night when he knows that he has to fill the jar with some blood like he has to, he takes some of it from one of the other jars and splits it between his But then he goes to open his door for the first time and the key actually pricks his finger and some of his blood drips down on the floor. (laughs) And then you're like, well, that's weird. Why are they like they're zooming in on it like it's going to be something like cool or something weird. And all of a sudden his blood starts getting sucked across the floorboards to a crack in the floorboards. And you're like, "Okay, well, there's something beneath the house, obviously, like we're not going to be able to. But then as soon as it pans out, there's literally like this like gnashing mouth, like teeth and tongue just like trying to suck up the blood as it shoots between the floorboards and it's like oh god that's so terrifying but that scene is actually really important because that initial I think that initial I guess taste of blood is what sort of connects Dan Stevens character to the lady of the island 
which is what we're going to find at the next point, because basically what happens is they hide his sister. After having his sister out in the square for like a day or two, they hide her in the basement, and they basically throw a giant festival to celebrate, because they know, like, their idea is if we throw a giant festival to celebrate, we made it very apparent where we were hiding his this sister, so whoever it is will come out and try to save her, or they'll try to get into this house. We'll know where to look. There's only one way to get in there, and he only knows how to get in. So, at this point, Dan Stevens has, like, a heart-to-heart with the one guy's son, and convinces him to help him, no matter what, or otherwise. Like, it almost blackmails him. He's like, I'm gonna tell them that you, like, are having sex with that one girl, and they're not gonna be happy about it. So, he enlists him to help him break into the house during the party, which they're expecting, but basically what happens is the house, the wooden house itself is built around a brick staircase that goes down into the ground into this crazy elaborate like basement tunnel system. And so there's this cool moment where Dan Stevens and the kid are under the raised wooden cabin and they're breaking out bricks to get into the under like the basement area of this house where they're keeping his sister and he's doing it there's a moment where like he's trying to do the like hitting the brick in in rhythm with the music so nobody hears him doing it and then they get through and he says like okay put the bricks back don't seal it but like i'll be back and at that point they realize that there's somebody under the house so the three dudes rush to get to the house. Dan Stevens is already in the basement looking for his sister. One of the dude, the one dude who actually gets to the house is the boy's father. So when the boy, when the father sees the boy, he's just like, okay, get out of here. I'm not going to say anything. I don't know who you've been working with, but like, I don't want you to get in trouble. So just get the fuck out of here. So he goes in and basically tells the prophet and the other guy, the third guy who will be a bigger deal later that, whoever they're looking for is already in the basement. So then at that point, he says, I'll stay here and watch this house. You go to one of the secret exits. Because there are these, we have seen these people go in and out of this like weird series of secret tunnels and stuff before. So we know, like they hint at it because they make it try to seem like it's like shady and sketchy and creepy. And so at that point, we have the one dude rides his horse out to the woods and is at the very far exit to these tunnels with a gun waiting for Dan Stevens to pop his head up, and he's going to prairie dog him and just, like, shoot him in the face. And then there's the other dude who goes down into the tunnels to try to basically flush him out, also has a gun, ready to shoot him in the face. And then there's the boy's dad who's just kind of like, okay, like, I'll wait here and see if he pops back up. So at this point, we're convinced there's no way for him to go without getting shot. And as he's looking around, there's this very tense moment where he almost goes up, like, the, the prophet can see his lamp, and he's going to go up this ladder and get shot in the face at the end of the tunnel. But he doesn't. Like, he's very close, he almost does. But he double backs, and there's this weird sewer system that goes even further down. It's, like, filled with, like, gross, poopy, bloody water. And so, of course, in very Resident Evil Silent Hill style, he has to dunk himself into this cesspool, basically, to get away from these guys. And he does that, and he's very, he, like, he turns out his lamp, or, like, he turns down his lamp. I don't know how it works. I'm surprised his lamp didn't go out in the shit water. But he's in this weird cesspool, running away from the dude with the gun. And the other dude with the gun goes up to where he almost popped his head up and got shot. And the 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 prophet almost shoots him, thinking it's Dan Stevens' character. But Dan Stevens' character is going further down in this, like, uh, sewer tunnel, basically. And he's up to... It's so, it's so claustrophobic. He's, like, up to his neck and shit. And it looks really gross. And he's like, you can just tell it's like, he's doing a great job acting because he's just convinced that it's like, oh, like, I I shouldn't be here. And he's just, and there's chunks of shit and gross stuff floating in the water and whatever. And um, then at one point, he kind of brushes past this thing that looks like an animal. And then it comes back to life. It's not dead yet, but it's like partially drowned. So it's like, I can't tell if it's a rat or a rabbit, but it freaks out. And he's freaking out kind of, but he's trying not to make too much noise. And then after that, He's like, like, it's pretty dark, but then he's like showing his light because he doesn't want to give his location away. And then there's like a splash and he like looks and that's when, like, this is one of the scarier parts in the movie. That's when this fucking naked, white-eyed, white-haired, creepy old woman just 
comes up from the water and just starts coming right at him. Like, not fast, just, like, slowly approaching him. And this is when, yeah, we're first introduced to the late, like, clearly introduced to the lady of the island. And they have, like, kind of a struggle and, like, they, they contact for a second and then she just disappears in this, like, shitty sewer water. But then he crawls out and gets out and gets away. They still don't know who they're looking for. But then it's sort of at that point it's established that shit's real weird and we're cut to this i think this is where there's a weird cut in the movie where it basically just shows you everything and there's this weird giant room that is basically filled with leaves and vines and twigs and everything it's all dead and then there's this woman who is entrenched in all the leaves and vines and everything and thorns and what have you and she's just trapped there and kind of just stuck and tied up in it and the prophet is basically talking to her and he's like, why would you expose yourself to him? Why would you tell him, of, like, why would you let him know you exist? Like, why would you do that and not for me? Like, why would you communicate with him? And he's like, I feed you. And he basically slashes his hand and he's like feeding her his blood. And as he's feeding her his blood, everything in the room starts to bloom. Everything comes back to life. All the vines start to blossom. And then we see this other character in the background that at first the way that it's cut I thought it was Dan Stevens character coming up from the sewer in this area like he was going to sneak up on him but then we find out that it's this weird like servant character who is just basically covered in like blood and shit and like is really gaunt and t he's like tall and gaunt and he almost has what looks like a wasp's nest or a bee's nest for a head like it's just like a weird wrapped thing with an eye hole and he's dragging something that we find out is later Dan Stevens sister in a burlap sack and so he kind of scurries past them and then bring like the camera work in this movie is amazing too. There's some great panning shots. And so we see like the interaction between the prophet and the lady of the island. And then it pans and we see the, the bee head, beehive head guy basically hang this burlap sack. Like he just hoists it up and then just like pulley rope and pulleys it up on the ceiling next to all these other burlap sacks, which I'm assuming are full of other girls or what have you that did not work out and because her her bag is the only one that's still like she's crying and twitching and kicking and you can tell she's still alive the other ones are moving and there's like blood kind of dripping out of the bottom of them so you're like okay well this is where this is where they keep the dinner i guess and so then yeah now at this point in the movie we are <laughs> clearly convinced that there is some weird shit going on and there is some supernatural weirdness with the island basically i'm assuming at this point lady of the island is in fact some sort of mother earth nature goddess person that has been entrapped by these three men that i mean like a lot of the things that i gleaned or assumed from the midway point of the movie wound up being pretty fairly explained by the end of the movie like they do a pretty good job of bringing it around and letting you know like what happened and you know what's basically happening but it does get really intense because then basically what happens after that Dan Stevens is desperately trying to find his sister. He's very injured at that point. He gets out of the sewer system. The prophet's daughter finds him and basically whisks him away to this area where she has secret medical supplies, where she's basically taking care of him and tending him to his wounds. And then I believe it's at that point where the third guy, the dad, who's one of the survivors who founded the colony, basically comes out as like almost full like fundamentalist christian like but still believes in like the lady of the island and all these things but like has this weird like that's the only downfall is like i feel like the religious zealotry that suddenly sprouted at this point of the film is not fully established well because it's just this third guy suddenly has this crazy following he's basically the disciplinarian and suddenly he has this power where people just listen to him and a couple people keep questioning his authority, but then he's just very gung-ho about protecting the island and people are behind him. And so it's this weird transition to the scene where the daughter is basically in the outhouse. And after she had the conversation with the prophet's daughter, she realized this, that she is pregnant because she hasn't had her period in a very long time. So she's trying to f test that while she's in the outhouse, but then... It pans out, and this is where you get that weird vibe from her dad, because her dad is basically just watching her with wild eyes through this hole in the outhouse wall. Like, this is something he normally does, but then when he realizes what she's doing, he's like, oh shit, wait, she's pregnant. And, like, I don't know if it's supposed to be implied that he normally watches her in the outhouse, or they have this weird, like, he has this weird perv on for his daughter, but that's the vibe I got, that he was kind of weirdly obsessed with her. So then she gets out of there, has... This con that has this like sweet conversation with the son of the other guy, where basically he 
she reveals to him that she's pregnant and he says that's great like you know I'm so happy like let's leave the island and then she's like oh we can't do that because it's just essentially established that nobody ever leaves the island if you do you're considered a traitor and they just kill you they just send people to kill you you don't you don't leave the island and so they're trying to basically pack and be all sneaky about it he has made something for her so he's like oh let me go get it I'll be right back and so he disappears but in the meantime dad gets back and the daughter and the dad have this really, really tense, uncomfortable conversation where it starts to basically come out that he's this, like, really strongly religious creepazoid person. And he's saying, like, oh, that thing in your womb is an abomination. It'll kill you. This and that. You have no right. You shouldn't have done this without permission. You're mine. This and that. And he's just screaming at her, and she's saying she's going to keep it, and she's going to leave, and she's going to be happy to be away from him. And, yeah, it's just terrible... And then it's just very heavily implied that something terrible is going to happen. And then a couple scenes later, we see the the son of the one guy returning with like like something I think that he put together, carved for her. And as soon as he comes into the house, there's the dad covered it. Well, no, there's the you just see the daughter and she's dead of like several stab wounds because right before we leave the previous scene, the dad just pulls out a big knife and says that he's going to take care of it, implying that he's probably going to cut the baby out of her, or like kill her. What, like what? You don't know his his mind. Like you know his mindset's like upset and crazy and demented and not balanced in any way, but you don't know what his intentions are at that point. But then yes, comes back. She's been butchered. And the son looks at him and he's like, what, you know, what did you do? Then they have their confrontation. They're wonderful. The reverse of basically being straightforward and asking for permission. (laughs) No, it's almost like instead of asking the dad permission to date the daughter, permission to marry the daughter, he's just basically like, well, now I'm going to kill you. And so earlier in the film, Dan Stevens' character developing this bond with this, this boy because he's helped him so much and he is kind of putting his neck out there and risking his his livelihood basically helping him sort of spy and figure things out and get a, get around the the commune without being detected. Dan Stevens is basically like, "Okay, you're you're a good person and I don't want you to get caught up in this, but if you need to, you have to use this." And he gives him like a straight edge razor, like a like a razor. And he's like, "You need to defend yourself no matter who it is. Like you need to get out of here. You need to take you and that girl and get off this island as quick as you can, but like if anybody gives you shit, you basically need to kill them." And he's straight up with him. So, of course, in this moment, the boy pulls the razor and tries to kill the girl's dad. They have, like, a pretty epic tussle. And that's one thing. So the the fights in this movie are so tense, but the fight choreography isn't... I, I mean, obviously, I wasn't expecting them to have, like, karate kung fu, crazy battles in this movie, like the raid. They're still really well choreographed, but they're not as... Like, they're not fast-paced, crazy fights they're just really brutal and so this boy and that girl's dad have like an intense tussle and the kid almost gets him almost because like you're almost rooting for him at that point because this you realize this dad is such a skis ball and you want this guy to die almost no you do you want him to die he's a terrible person and he the boy almost gets to kill him almost so close almost even gets to cut his ear off it's pretty brutal this movie's pretty brutal and then it gets to a point where you see the, the dad run away and he's out there in the middle of town like he busts open the door and he's covered in blood and the boy's covered in blood and then you're just like oh shit he's gonna he's gonna put it all on him and sure enough the dad starts yelling claiming that the the boy killed his daughter and the boy's there covered in blood holding a razor so it looks really bad and then the boy does what everybody does in this situation which is terrible and he just runs which makes him look even guiltier but he's running, and he's running, he's running, he's running through a cornfield, and the security guys kind of run after him. They all have their crazy giant spears and stuff. And at this point, Dan Stevens is with the prophet's daughter in the cornfield, where she's still tending to his wounds. He tells the story, which I sort of ruined earlier, where he explains, like, they're talking about their religious beliefs, and, like, he's he's sort of trying to convince her as well to, like, leave the island. Like, do you even really believe in everything that your dad talks about? And she's like, yes, well, you know, the island's very interesting, and blah, blah, blah. He's like, what do you believe in? And 
you know, she sort of remarks on the fact that he seems like he came from like a, like a religious background. He's like, well, yeah, you know, like I've been in this situation before I fought and I worked for my God and, you know, I believed in Jesus and I went to, I think he's somewhere in China, I think. And there's a flashback where he explains that they went into a town or a village and tried to convert everyone and they were well received until the night where they weren't and they were all dragged out of their tents and cabins and butchered burned alive and just mutilated and murdered and awfully and so there's this big dramatic scene where these people are running around and all these asian people are killing the other missionaries and then to top it all off because basically the story comes out because he dan stevens takes his shirt off at one point he's just got all these bruises and cuts and like a giant burn on his back and he tells the story that leads up to him getting branded with a giant iron crucifix at the end of it so it's very like it's very dramatic and very brutal but it just works really well to almost seal the conviction of his character because you know he's already been through so much that he talks at length at several points in the movie is how much his sister means to him knowing that she's basically all that he's got left after he survived all this other bullshit that he's like yeah of course he's gonna get through this this seems like a cakewalk but then it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and so it's at this point when all the other shit happens where the security guys are chasing the the guy's son through the cornfield believing that he killed the other guy's daughter and he comes up to them and he tries to hide with them but then now he basically led them to to the secret area where she's been practicing secret medical techniques and like like healing people that she shouldn't have been healing or like helping people doctoring people that she shouldn't have been doctoring and also like dan stevens character is there so they take him into custody they take the boy to take dan stevens character into custody and they bring him back to town the boy and by the time they got back to town because there's one scene where it cuts away and the 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 uber religious guy has basically rallied all the troops and they're at first they're like well you're not the prophet and he's like well yeah but he's not in charge either i'm the only one here i'm the one who's going to protect you guys like we need to do this we need to establish law and order and he just does like martial law and all of a sudden he snaps to and apparently all the security guys are under his thumb as well as like a bunch of these weird creepy religious almost like they look like clansmen they're basically wearing black robes and giant black hoods that just are like big pointy crazy hoods but they're all in black so it's like uber creepy and they're all set up in the dead center of town with this machine that they has all these freaking vices so there's a vice for both arms both legs and the head and one of the best parts of the movie is it sucks and it's awesome at the same time they put the kid they basically carry him almost in like a christ-like way in a cross and slap him down on the table, put his arms and legs, vice them in, and you can hear the bones kind of cracking as they vice him in. But then when they do the vice on his head, it goes into this crazy like POV point of view camera. And as the, the vice starts tightening on his skull, you hear the cracking and like the view of the camera, you actually see blood vessels popping. And blood kind of shoots across the vision of the guy's, the kid's eyes. And you just see that happen. And suddenly he just kind of, he doesn't die, but he just, he stops struggling. And it's so terrifying and painful and brutal to watch. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is then everybody in town gathers around and the asshole religious dad guy gives like some dumb, vaguely religious thing about how he needs to cleanse the evil out of the kid and like they're the righteous and they need to burn the burn the will of whatever into him and then that's when you realize that what they're going to do is i can't remember what the procedure is called but basically what the table is set up to do is drill into his skull and take out an entire section of his like take out a huge section of his skull cap to expose his brain to calm him down was a belief that they had back in the day and so the guy the, the shitty dad guy goes up with the straight razor that he stole from the kid shaves a big chunk off the top of his head like just like like takes a bunch of his hair off and then cranks a couple of cranks so that the drill sort of first perforates the top of his head and then there's just these arduous turns of the screw where he's then knocking it once knocking it twice knocking it three i think it's like three or four times that he does it and then he pulls it away and the sound is just so gross And you just know, because I've seen this recently, and I was thinking about it, I saw it recently, because I've been watching through Channel Zero, Butcher's Block, and they did something very similar in, I think, the second or third episode of that series. But then it just pans out, and you're like, are they going to show it? 
are they going to show it? They're not going to show it. And then shitty, shitty dad, shitty religious dad guy says something. He, he goes to one of the other monks and with the crazy black hood clansman get up and he pulls a pair of pliers out of one of the dude's robes and it has a rose petal. So it's pliers with rose petal. And he says something like, let this image or let this vi- thing of peace bring you peace of mind. But like literally then takes the pliers with the rose petal and stuffs it into the kid's brain. Like at this point, I'm pretty sure the kid was already dead, but then he just jams a rose petal into his brain. Like, I don't know if that's supposed to be like, if it's all supposed to be symbolic or how that's supposed to work or what it's supposed to mean. Like, I get it. But, like, was he supposed to be still alive after that? Or was that just a form of... Pu- was it an execution? Was it an execution or a punishment? That's what I couldn't tell, I guess. But it's still brutal. And, like, you don't see the kid... Like, it's just... Like, the kid's dead at that point. But, like, I don't know if he's supposed to be or if, like... It just happens. Like, at this point, the, the movie starts going off the rails. Because then they don't know what they're going to do with Dan Stevens' character. Because they have him sort of pinned with... They have him subdued with the, the spears. And then the other dad comes back to find his son dead freaks out he gets the security people to take care of him carry him away and then the prophet comes back the prophet and the crazy uber religious dad who's suddenly like the head of the colony who's like out of nowhere the uber bad guy suddenly have a standoff and have like a a a difference of opinions and an argument and then they get distracted and they're trying to figure out they realize that dan stevens character is the one they've been looking for the whole time and they're about to kill him When Dan Stevens' character breaks free because the third guy, whose son got killed, comes out with a gun and says that he's going to finish everything, implying that he's basically going to go to the secret place where they keep the Lady of the Island and kill her and end everything. So, to back up a little bit, there was a side plot where basically it is believed that the Lady of the Island takes care of the whole island, keeps it lush, keeps it growing, but more recently, in the last year or so, they've been running out of supplies, they've been running out of fruit or food and vegetables and things because the island has been dying and it's implied that this is because of the fact that these three men captured this goddess and have just been like keeping her imprisoned and like feeding her blood and like the blood of rats and other gross animals and like just like not treating her very well and so she's doing her best to fight back but so this guy is on his way to kill her and there's a there's a chase where Dan Stevens at this point has this connection with the Lady of the Island, so he knows where to go to, and so he's chasing this guy. Not sure, you're not quite sure what he's going to do, if he's going to save the Lady of the Island, or if he also thinks that she needs to die, or like, what's going to happen? And so at this point, the dude gets to the the hut in the middle of the woods where the, the Lady of the Island and her beehive head slave helper dude live, and a shot is heard as soon as he enters the building, and Dan Stevens is like right behind him, so he like kind of waits and the dude comes out and he has just like a giant hole in his chest and then he gets shot again in the head and that guy's just dead and then there's this really tense moment where like dan stevens character is kind of trying to make it seem like he's not there because he was pressed against the wall whoever's in there doesn't realize that he's there and then you realize it's the bee beehive head guy with a giant shotgun (laughs) protecting the lady of the island and so then dan stevens basically does this brilliant maneuver where he gets out of there without Beehive Head seeing him as he comes out of the door and then ducks underneath the house and, like, hides behind some some bushes. And then crazy uber-religious creeper dad and the prophet get to the house at the same time to find their friend dead, have another confrontation where the uber-religious guy is basically like, I'm in charge now, nobody should have listened to you, like, I'll fix everything, I'm doing what we have to do, you were too much of a pussy not to do it, and shoots him with a sawed-off shotgun or whatever it is, a rifle, at close range but in the shoulder so he doesn't die. He, the prophet, gets shot, flies back, falls into the pit that was the exit door of the tunnels that go everywhere. So he basically gets shot and then falls like 20 feet down this ladder into the ground, so the guy just thinks he's dead. He's not dead. But then Dan Stevens at this point gets up and he's in the where they keep the the lady of the the island and she's up there and he sees her and he sort of has a moment but then he's sneaking around because the other guy the bee head hive bee hive head guy is in there but then he notices the bags moving against the wall and he realizes he hears it and he realizes it's sister so then he's taking all this time like he's trying to sneak around trying to be quiet but then he gets his sister down from the bag as 
beehive head guy kills some animal and feeds the the blood to the lady of the island and he dan stevens character frees his sister and they have this like great reunion because she still thinks he's dead at this point she hasn't seen him at all she still thinks he's dead so he's there to save her they have this great reunion great moment but then they've been making so much noise that yeah then beehive head guy out of nowhere comes with a giant iron so-and-so and and just like knocks dan stevens in the head at that point i thought he was just dead i thought that was just gonna be the end it was just gonna be like (laughs) fucking bad ending for everybody almost then at that point essentially what happens is dan stevens character is left there with the beehive head guy and his sister as well as the prophet's daughter are taken by the dad and imprisoned and shackled in this like room and then we're treated to this great moment where dan stevens is on this rack and he's got fish hooks giant fish hooks in his arm in his hands and his knees like they're all stuck through him and they're dra- like his shoulders i think too and they're dragging him up onto this like it's a brutal like all the punishments of this movie all the executions are brutal in this movie and they're dragging him up on this table and basically feeding him into what i can only describe as like a really fucked up meat grinder yeah, it's just, it's got teeth and it just keeps rolling and it'll crush anything. Like, it's not even, it won't cut, it just crushes. So you can just tell whatever's gonna happen is painful. But it's just like, he's already so close by the time he gets up there, but that like, it's just happening so quick already that he can't really react or do anything to it. So what happens is almost immediately he loses like half a, like Dan Stevens' character loses half a hand. Like you see like his fingers get just eaten, like half his hand and fingers just get eaten by this machine. And that's when almost... Like, anybody else would have gone into shock, probably, you know? Like, he probably would have just shut down and gotten eaten by this machine, but because he's his character's been through so much shit, and his life is so shit right now, he's just ready to... And he's been taking those pain meds for so long, I'm just assuming that this is all supposed to be suspension of disbelief. And at this point, the fish hooks came out of that hand because he lost most of it, and so he was able to free himself. He took the hook out of his other hand, out of his knees, and he attacks beehive head guy and they get into a big fight and be that's when you realize how big he actually is and they're fighting they're fighting they're fighting and then he whips one of the dan stevens whips one of the fish hooks at him catches him in the face in the beehive face and he pulls him down onto the onto the the thing and he starts pulling him into the the meat grinder thing and you're you're really like at this point you're like yeah well you know you got a little bit of a taste for it when it like ate his fingers like i kind of want to see what it's going to do to this guy's head weirdly like grossly but we don't we don't necessarily get that i can't the action that occurs in this scene while it does seem again like a great little kerfuffle that would happen in a raid movie it's not like kung fu karate but it is a great fight and a great struggle but then the hook is attached to something else and they're fighting and he's like beehive head guy is holding dan stevens in a way where he's like about to stab him or like like he's going to plunge something into his eye socket, I think. And then Dan Stevens kicks a thing with his free leg causing a reaction that basically rips the fish hook out of the thing's face and basically rips off most of its face. We don't get to see what it looks like under the beehive thing, but it dies. So he kills beehive head guy with a fish hook. Pretty brutal. And then Dan Stevens takes some time to recover, wrap his hand, and then at this point basically he approaches the He approaches the Lady of the Island and they have this exchange where he sees through her eyes and basically learns, like, what happened. The fact that they came to the island, she saved them initially, but then they took advantage, imprisoned her, and made her take care of them for all these years. And why she sort of wants to die, essentially. And at that point, Dan Stevens is... I don't know if he's under her control, but he knows what she wants and he sets everything on fire and says, like, I'm sorry, and torches her as well and sets the whole thing on fire, burns the Lady of the Island down, burns all the the vegetation, and then slowly but surely the the fire works its way back to town. So then by the time Dan Stevens get back to town, everything starts to be catching on fire. And then we learn that the crazy psycho-religious dad guy has the prophet's daughter and Dan Stevens' sister. And he's basically telling them, all these great things that he's done and all these great things that he will do and how he's actually really the good guy and that he's basically telling the future like how he'll he will be the one to save the village and he will be the one to bring peace and prosperity and provide for everyone and it all sounds well and good until suddenly he's like and you will surrender your bodies to me whenever i want you to 
and then it's just like like not that it wasn't terrible before but then it's just extra terrible like you at that point you're like wow this guy really needs to die and so Dan Stevens arrives just in time to save the day and comes in fighting with the like he literally just comes so as at that point like they realize that everything's catching on fire and the girls both are begging the psycho religious dad guy to let them go and he says some smarmy line about it. he's like oh no like you know this is good for you and he goes to leave and at that point i think yeah dan stevens just comes in with a knife and just stabs the dude and then you're just like yes like i didn't want any more close calls there were a couple close calls when he got killed almost killed before but now he at least has a knife in his gut but then they struggle and they start fighting and Dan Stevens is already, like, on his last legs because he's, you know, missing half a hand. He's been beat to all hell. He's been going through so much in this movie. But he's got him on the ground. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, while they're struggling on the ground, the psycho-religious dad guy drops his gun. And one of the, like, the Dan Stevens' sister gets it. And instead of... She's about to shoot the psycho-dad guy. But instead, the prophet's daughter is like, No, shoot the chain so we can get out of here. And so they shoot the chain, they pull it out of the wall, and in the meantime, Psycho Dad Guy pulls his knife out and basically, like, almost, like, gut, like, he doesn't gut him, but he stabs Dan Stevens' character, like, five or six times, and it's not a small knife, it's a big knife, so, like, that's not good. But then at this point, they're struggling because he gets the knife, Dan Stevens gets the knife away from Psycho, Psycho Dad Guy, but he's still trying to force the knife deeper into Psycho Dad Guy, and then at this point, best part of the movie... The sister and the daughter, the prophet's daughter and Dan Stevens' sister, wrap the chains around psycho-religious dad guy's throat and start choking him, but then they start pulling him as they're choking him, and Dan Stevens is holding onto the knife, and so basically he drags his knife all the way down the dude's gut and just fully, like, fillets him. And it's so satisfying because up to that moment, that guy just so needed to die. And um, so, yeah, they kill him. They have a moment where he's like, no, leave me. Like, Dan Stevens is like, no, leave me. Like, I'm going to die. And then the girls are like, no, we can't leave you. And they had previously talked with one of the women and told, like, Dan Stevens was like, hold one of those boats. Like, I'm going to be sending these two girls down. You guys, you have to wait for them. They have to escape with you. And so then they're like slowly but surely making their way to the evacuation route where all the boats are leaving and there's this great moment where we again hear the island sort of going crazy everything's catching on fire and every so often we sort of hear like a woman screaming and we realize that's like the lady of the island still kind of dying but as the lady is there the the one lady who they had told to hold the boat for them not the lady of the island the lady who's waiting on the boat they get to a top of a hill and like Dan Stevens is like looks like pale as a sheet and he's just like dunzo and he's just like leave me I'm only gonna slow you down you guys need to make that boat leave me here I'm sorry but not sorry I can't go any further they have their goodbyes and the two girls get down to the boat and as they're boarding the boat there's this scream like this this old lady scream and there's this cave, there's this rock face on the edge of the island where, like, there's a huge cave, and all this fire and blood just shoots out of it, which we can only assume was what, like, everything that the the lady of the island had, like, eaten or devoured or what have you, like, the reserves of her blood food. Just shoot. It's a great scene where, like, blood and fire just shoot out of this cave, and the people in the boat are just like, yeah, fuck this place. And so they start boating away, and then it's at that point where we're back up on the, the hillside on the cliff where, like, Dan Stevens is kind of watching them paddle away and get to safety. And then he is approached by the prophet. The prophet sort of wanders up to him, and he's also kind of in shitty shape because he's been shot in the shoulder, and he just, like, he had to dig himself out of a pit before it exploded. And so Dan Stevens and the prophet are sitting there on top of a hill, and this is how the movie wraps. They both kind of look at each other, and they sort of smile weirdly because the prophet's still kind of a scumbag. But then... Dan Stevens lays in the grass and all of a sudden you can tell like his face like kind of does all this shit where he has all these emotions go over him and all of a sudden the grass around him starts growing very rapidly and then he looks at the guy again and he smiles more and then like Dan Stevens just the closing shot is just a upward shot of Dan Stevens laying in the grass as it sort of overtakes him like all the vines start growing in and his eyes sort of change color to the crazy intense like yellow green 
that the Lady of the Island had, and you realize that she not only told him her story, but also passed on her godlike abilities to Dan Stevens. So, in a way, like, it's not an ending, but it's a beginning. Like, I'm assuming he didn't die, but he sort of became the island, and sort of, in a way, the prophet got what he wanted. The island, while destroyed, will be renewed by whatever Dan Stevens' character does, but that's where it basically, like, cuts to black, where he... You basically see him sort of growing into the grass and becoming a new... He's the man of the island or what have you. The new god of the island. Which I think is really interesting. Interesting way to end the movie. Considering it's all this death and destruction and darkness towards the end of the movie. And then all of a sudden there's that great theme of rebirth and renewal and rejuvenation. And, you know, all that greenness after all that, like, red gore sort of came out of nowhere. It sort of starts really slow and then it just ramps up to 11 and then it just kind of slowly fades out to peaceful green and I think it really is balanced really well in that way I know I just did probably like a shitty job of surmising the whole movie but that's it that is the apostle so who is the apostle I don't actually know that's a good is it the prophet or is it Dan Stevens character really if you think about it because he is really devoted to his his religion in a way like Dan Stevens character is basically really devoted to like his sister to Jesus at one point, and then towards the end of the movie, to the Lady of the Island, in a way. But I think it's a great film. Yes, if you have Netflix, you want to watch something hooky spooky in the spooky month of Spooktober, check out The Apostle. It is in Netflix original. It's on there now, starring Dan Stevens. And yeah, so thank you again, as always, for tuning in to Fear Boners. We're going to wrap the episode there. I've talked my ear off. Um, I'm out of bourbon. So I have to get going. But yeah, as always, appreciate you tuning in. We will be back sooner rather than later. But before we get into talking about where else you can find us on the internet, uh, I just want to again give a special shout out to Mike the Shredder Blewett for composing our brand new theme song. You hear it in the intro and the outro music. He did a lot of work on that. Took him a long time, but totally worth putting that together because you can really tell he worked his Big old booty off, getting that out on time for us and for the show. So big shout out to Blewett for that. So thank you, sir. Really appreciate it. And if you like what you've heard, you can find more over on downinfrontpodcast.com. We also have a Facebook page over on facebook.com backslash downinfrontpodcast. You can also email the Down In Front guys directly at the crew at downinfrontpodcast.com. We also have a YouTube channel where we post some of our video teasers as well as full episodes. You can look for us on there. We also have the Gamescast over on Twitch where sometimes you'll see Bryland or maybe Warren and myself playing some Monster Hunter or Spider-Man or what have you, just shooting the shit. You can find that over at twitch.tv backslash down in front podcast. We also have an Instagram where we post a lot of the art from our episodes, the title pages, as well as links directly to the episodes. You can follow us there to keep you up to date. All of these places, as well as Twitter, at underscore D-I-F-P, or at Fearboners D-I-F-P, we will constantly keep you updated with new content when we release new things, or you can also go back and look at our back catalog. We're well over 100 episodes at this point, so there's so much listening for you. If it's a new movie, if it's an old movie, classic movie, we have an episode for you at this point that you're probably going to want to listen to if you haven't already heard it. And also, also, also... You guys have heard me say this a few times already, but it goes without saying. We love you. We love having this ongoing conversation, and we do it absolutely for free. But if for any reason you feel like you'd love to contribute and help us make sure that we get this content out to you on time, then take a look over at Patreon at patreon.com backslash down in front podcast you can potentially sign up to uh, dedicate a dollar, five dollars a month, what have you. Even a dollar helps. Like an Arizona iced tea, the price is on the can. Every little bit helps us to get this content out to you on time, fresh, and delivered to your ears, whether it be on your lunch break, on your commute to work, from work, what have you. We'd love to have you listen to us wherever you are, even if it's on the toilet. That doesn't bother us. Just don't tell us about it. So anyway, thanks again for listening. We'll be back sooner rather than later. And as always, keep it creepy and stay spooky, dear listeners. Thank you.